recording. Um, hello, everyone. This is the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for July Monday, July twenty fifth, twenty twenty two. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. What is Circuit Python? Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. We host this meeting on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it/discord. We hold the meeting in the hashtag CircuitPython Dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens at Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday, then we usually move it to Tuesday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online and add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the Outside Circuit Pythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc contains timestamps to go along with the video, so we use the doc. You can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we'll post the link for the next meeting notes to the document to the CircuitPython dev channel. Check the pin messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. So if you go up to the top of the CircuitPython dev channel, you can see um, a push pin, and if you click on that, you can find a link to the notes document. The meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. The second is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. The third is hug reports. The fourth is status updates. And the fifth part is in the weeds, if we have any in the weeds discussions, which is kind of for extended things that don't fit elsewhere. Um, so with that, we'll start with uh, community news. And I'll take a timestamp. And my timestamp thing is working and is on time. Great. OK. Um, this community news comes from the CircuitPython newsletter. It's called from uh, the most prominent items in it each week, thanks to uh, Anne, who works on the CircuitPython newsletter each week. So um, to start, um, the first item is uh, a new version of CircuitPython 7 was released. CircuitPython 7.3.2 is the latest bug fix revision of CircuitPython and is a new stable release. Notable changes to 7.3.2 since 7.3.1 include Adafruit Matrix Portal. For that board, we restored the traceback module, which allows async I.O. use. Um, that was just an, an error. Sorry about that. Uh, another bug that was fixed was to re always release displays during deep sleep. That lets them um, go blank. And uh, the last thing was to update uh, frozen libraries. In particular, we needed to update uh, some of the um, uh, network-related libraries, such as ESP32 SPI and Adafruit requests on certain airlift boards, which frees them to save uh, RAM space. And the older versions of the libraries were causing problems there. OK, uh, next item is about Discord. Um, Discord, we now have uh, 35,000 members of the Adafruit Discord. That's like an incomprehensible number of people, <laughs> as far as I can say. Uh, but that's fantastic. Uh, the, to read the news item, the Adafruit Discord community, where we do all our CircuitPython development in the open, reached over 35,000 humans. Thank you. Adafruit believes Discord offers a unique way for Python and hardware folks to connect. You can join today at https slash slash adafruit.it slash discord. That's a points to an invite for the that Adafruit Discord. Uh, next item is to note that this year, Circuit Python Day 2022 is August 19th. Um, 
we designate this as the snakiest day of the year. This day highlights all things CircuitPython and Python and hardware. Usually we have this day in August or September, depending on uh, timing of various other things. If you're working with CircuitPython and you'd like to note something about it for CircuitPython Day, tag your projects uh, with hashtag CircuitPython Day 2022 on social media, media and Adafruit will look to highlight them. Do you have events that you'd like folks to have, have folks attend or projects in the works on that day? Email your thoughts to circuitpythonday at adafruit.com. So we have a couple of events uh, I'm going to mention. Um, first of all, there'll be a panel discussion with Katni, Jeff, Dan, and Tim, which will be hosted by Paul Cutler. More details on that are coming soon. Then we'll have a more freeform video chat with Jeff, Dan, and Katni. This will be the third year in a row that Jeff, Dan, and Katni will sit down and chat about their involvement and latest favorite contribution to CircuitPython. And there'll be a special CircuitPython-themed edition of Show and Tell, hosted by Liz Clark. Details are still being solidified, but start prepping your CircuitPython-related projects you're interested in participating. So this show and tell is not the regular Wednesday show and tell. This is a special show and tell for uh, CircuitPython Day. Um, next item is that um, uh, Foamy Guy CircuitPython Day game jam stream. On CircuitPython Day, Foamy Guy says, I'll be combining two of my favorite things, CircuitPython and games. I will stream the making of a CircuitPython game jam game. My goal will be to make a basic but playable and fun game within the time constraints of a few hours, and I'll be streaming the process. After the stream, I will publish the code to the game so folks can play it on their own CircuitPython devices. Okay, and then another item that's scheduled. Um, is that at 11 a.m., uh, already the time for this event is already set. Um, at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, 5 p.m., uh, I guess the Central European time, reimagining IoT deployments with CircuitPython. Adafruit CircuitPython has helped to open up the IoT space and place it within the reach of developers of all types. Join us on CircuitPython Day as we look at getting started with CircuitPython and wireless IoT, walking through a real-world CircuitPython-based IoT project, and remotely updating CircuitPython firmware with cellular IoT. This is unusual because we don't have specific cellular support, so this is very interesting. You can register for this event at the link that's in the note stock. And I'm not sure who's sponsoring this, but it's great. Thank you. Okay. So I mentioned that the news for that I just discussed um, is comes from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is emailed every Tuesday. Uh, there's a link to the complete archives uh, in the notes document. The newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the, around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. You can contribute things to the newsletter by uh, doing a pull request to uh, a GitHub repo, that link is in the newsletter. You can also tag a tweet on Twitter with uh, hash mark CircuitPython, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. Any of those are gratefully accepted for news for the newsletter. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is the state of CircuitPython, uh, the CircuitPython libraries, and Blinka. And this is a look at CircuitPython by the numbers. Um, it gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're up to. We'll talk about the project overall and then discuss the core libraries in Blinka. So first, uh, the overall statistics. Um, over the past week, we had 44 pull requests merged with 16 authors. Um, a couple of new authors I don't recognize are Windstormer GER and DJ Hedges, maybe also Carl FL, um, and maybe Tim Wodge. I'm not sure if those are, people are completely new or not. There were six reviewers of these 44 pull requests, and there were 16 issues closed by eight people and 15 opened by 12 people. So as is typical, we have about the same number of issues open each week. Okay. Next up is about the CircuitPython core, and uh, Scott, if you're available, 
Feel free to read that. Yes, let me scroll up. Okay, so the numbers for the core, we had seven pull requests merge from eight different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. We had two reviewers, Jeff and Dan, so thanks to them as well. We have 23 open pull requests, so we have a lot to take a look at. Um, the oldest is 312 days old, so we should take a look at that. Um, and the number of the old ones are board specific, so take a look at those if you have boards uh, and, and get, give those a test if you can help us out. Um, issues wise for the core, we had six closed issues by three people, eight open by eight people, so we're up two. For a total of 551 open issues. Uh, we have five active milestones. Uh, this is kind of how we triage uh, the issues that we have. We have six issues that are not assigned to milestones, so those are the ones that we need to triage. Uh, we have zero open for 73x, which is awesome, and we have 50 open for 8.0, so we've got lots to work, uh, lots of work to do for uh, 8.0, and I believe that that number uh, previously was not quite accurate, but now uh, we've done a pass over that, so that I think that is kind of where we're at in terms of 8.0. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't do beta and alpha releases before then, though. So uh, that will be what we're working on. And that's it for the core. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, thank you. now Katni will uh, go over uh, the state of libraries. Thanks, Dan. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. Uh, this week we had 35 pull requests merged from seven different authors and six different reviewers. Um, I see one of the pull requests was 38 days, so it's good to see that we're still, um, we're still getting older PRs done. Uh, and that leaves us with 23 open pull requests, which with all these 35, it means we're keeping up with the recent ones quite well as well, because that number um, hasn't changed in a bit. We had 10 issues closed by six people and seven opened by five people, leaving us with 668 open issues. 175 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing on the Python side of CircuitPython, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. If you are interested in contributing by reviewing, check out the open pull requests. If you're interested in contributing uh, code or documentation, check out the open issues. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. And if you are entirely new to um, Git or GitHub, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and that covers all of that. And we're always available on Discord to help out. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, uh, there were no new libraries, but a pretty significant list of updated libraries, which are in the notes if you are interested, and I will not read them off here. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. All right, thank you, Katni. Okay, next up is Blinka. Maker Melissa, Melissa couldn't be here today, so I'll go ahead and read that section. Uh, Blinka, let me find the description of Blinka. Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython on single board computers like Raspberry Pi, you can also use Blinka on top of MicroPython to use CircuitPython libraries. So it is, uh, it runs either, mostly we use Blinka to run CPython and then um, can run CircuitPython code underneath that. So in the last week, there were two pull requests merged with one author and two, one reviewer. Um, there are still four open pull requests. Some of them have been open for more than a year. Um, so we should probably take a look at those. There are 79 open issues on Blinka, and there were 7427 PyWheels downloads in the last month. There are now 89 boards supported by Blinka, which is fantastic. Okay, uh, now we'll move on. Whoops, we'll move on to Hug Reports. Hold on just a second. I put a timestamp in the how to run the meeting document. So um, anyway, Hug Reports is where is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. As I mentioned, this section is held as a round robin. I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically um, to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, but have Hug Reports and Notes document, I'll just read them off as I get to them in the list. 
so as I mentioned, I will start. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Brent for some discussions on ESP32 SPI and related topics. Uh, he knows a lot about that from doing all the whippersnapper work and from working on the NINA firmware. Uh, thanks to Katni for managing the addition of Discord's moderation bot over the past several weeks and handling some new issues that came up with DinoBot, the previous moderation bot that we were, were using and are still using to some extent. Um, thanks to Jeff for continuing to brainstorm and for discussions on the plain ESP32 port. And thanks to Paul Cutler, who I had and other people had a brief preparation meeting with about the CircuitPython day panel that we're going to, that he's going to run. Okay, next up is Ask Patrick W. I don't see them in the chat, so I'll go ahead and read theirs. Thanks to Collins Lab for this excellent YouTube short on pull-up resistors. It was helpful to me for getting the uh, the Beetle into firmware download mode with no buttons on the board and a group hug. Okay. Uh, next is David Cloud, who also isn't uh, present or is text only. He's, he's here, but not te but it's text only. Thanks to Kmatch and Foamy Guy for the work on the hack tablet. Thanks to Narodoc for Disco Tool and for joining Calm, the Disco de la Tentation from the French speaking streamer uh, Tiddy Moby. Uh, I think this is under this is. Uh, Discord about some interesting uh, technology that people would like to buy. Uh, thanks to Paul Cutler and all the participants to the Sir Python Show podcast. I think I recognized his voice while listening to the recording of last week's meeting. Uh, next up is Deshipu. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Kmatch for the work on the hack tablet. Uh, Jeff Epler again. I started using the display, 16, 8 and 16 bit displays and the camera on the ESP32. So thank you for implementing that. It's really fun. Well, the 16 bit is not implemented yet, but <laughs> still it's uh, interesting. Uh, for me, guy, for pushing, uh, pushing for, for more, more games and uh, uh, MacGyver for uh, TIO. Okay, thank you, Desipu. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, Hugs reports uh, this week first. Thank you to Katni for uh, getting started on the planning and preparations for CircuitPython Day. Um, similarly, thank you to Paul Cutler for uh, getting preparations in motion for the panel discussion on CircuitPython Day. Um, thank you to Kmatch for all of his ongoing work on the Hack Tablet and providing those devices. And then uh, lastly, thank you to Matt Giver, uh, the creator of TO, for that um, useful tool and also for uh, stopping by the Discord to introduce themselves today. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Foamy Guy. OK, next up is Jeff. Hello. So I want to thank you, Katni, for apparently dropping everything to work on a Fritzing diagram for me. Uh, Dan, thanks for your helpful discussion with me. You got me over a roadblock on the ESP32 stuff. There are more roadblocks, but we'll get to them. And like several others of us, I need to thank Paul Cup for a quick getting to know you chat. I'm looking forward to being on the panel discussion. And uh, last, uh, to Eva for uploading all the CircuitPython libraries to PyPI. And I'll talk about that just a little bit more when we get down to status updates in a bit to clear that up for folks who may be wondering. OK, thanks, Jeff. OK, next up is Katni. Thanks, Dan. So I have a hug report for my dad for giving up half his week last week to take the lead on redoing a storeroom and adding another room to our basement, uh, to my housemate Brian for helping out with the project, and to my partner Rose for doing all of the drywall mudding. Um, echo a couple others with a hug report for Matt Giver for authoring and maintaining TO, uh, to Paul Cutler for hosting and more importantly preparing the panel discussion for CircuitPython Day. To Maker Melissa for confirming a project build live stream for CircuitPython Day, and to Tectric for a huge list of things, um, probably stuff I wouldn't have remembered anyway, so I just put a huge list of things and a group hug. All right, thank you, Katni. All right, next up, Kmatch. Thanks, Dan. Uh, first, uh, hug goes to folks on the Discord chat for some suggestions on 
separating single f signals from noise and how to do some uh, initial signal analysis. Thank you all for that. Uh, second, Foamy Guy, thanks for uh, your collaboration on the Hack Tablet, uh, especially including your live streams and organizing the giveaway for CircuitPython Day. And particular thanks, I was overjoyed to see you playing around with the tablet and having fun in the process, so thanks for that. Uh, and finally, thanks to Paul Cutler for inviting me to participate in this week's CircuitPython Show podcast. Yeah, thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa, who I mentioned is out. So I'll read her contributions. Thanks to everybody involved with CircUp. I hadn't tried it in a while, and I just tried it, and it worked very well. And then a group hug. OK. Uh, next is Naradoc, who's text only. Um, so I'll read group hug to everyone helping in the Help with CircuitPython channels and others. Thanks to Katni and the mods fighting the uprising of the Discord bot. Um, Thanks to Matt Guyver for the great TIO program. I use it every day and tell everyone to use it. And thanks to Tetrick, R. Hooper, Dan H. Jepler for PR and issues feedback. All right. Terrific. OK. Next up is Paul Cutler, if you're available. I am. Thanks, Dan. Um, as has been mentioned, thanks to Katni, Tim, Jeff, and Dan for making some time last week. It was great having a quick chat and getting to know all of you. And I look forward to the panel. All right. Thanks, Paul. All right, uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug to Naradoc for the course tweaks for the web workflow. We'll look at that today. And then also a hug report to ask Patrick W., who's been adding a bunch of ESP boards, and those need creation IDs, so they've been super helpful getting uh, creation IDs really fleshed out. Basically, they're USB IDs for rewards that don't have USB. So uh, thanks to Patrick for that. OK. Thank you, Scott. OK, next up is Tetrick, who says not present, but uh, has a group hug. I, I see him in the chat, but perhaps he's occupied. OK, and then uh, finally, um, G3 Holiday, uh, who's lur also lurking, uh, gives a group hug. So thank you very much. OK, uh, next is status updates. This is our time to sync up on what we're doing. This section is also held um, where I start, then we go through the list alphabetically. Um, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. And uh, you can discuss CircuitPython stuff, or if there's something else that's of interest, feel free to talk about that too. If they end up having a discussion about something, or you'd like to bring up something to discuss in more detail, you can, we can discuss it in the In the Weeds discussion. So I will start. Um, I released CircuitPython 7.3.2 to mix, fix a missing module on Matrix Portal and to update frozen libraries with important network-related fixes, as I mentioned. And I had an extended discussion with Jeff on ESP32 troubleshooting, which we both learned a lot from. And uh, right now, I'm testing why ESP32 SPI is failing with various test cases offered by users. Like right now, I'm trying to figure out, it looks like uh, when you make an MQTT connection that it can time out after about a minute or so unknown to uh, the people who are trying to use it. And it's breaking one of our projects, the PyPlanner project in specific, specifically. And finally, to understand all this, I'm making more of an effort to actually understand how to use sockets because I've used them in a very casual way before. But I have to keep reading these socket how-to every few years to remind myself of things. Like uh, when you receive an empty thing, it means the socket is closed and stuff like that. All right. Um, next is Ask Patrick W, who's not here. So I'll read their contribution. Two weeks ago, I made a board defini definition for the DF Robot Beetle ESP32 C3. Uh, this board is a bit odd as it has no mode or reset button. In the cporg.board page, I included a drawing and steps on how to get it into firmware flashing mode. So that is interesting. <laughs> OK. This Beetle also comes with an add-on prototyping and display cable board, which sits on hat style, which connects to all the pins on the board. I need to look at how other boards have handled this. It is unclear if it should be in the board definition or if it should be handled in the library. And I'm tracking it in CircuitPython uh, issue 6616. Or maybe that's a PR. This week, I am planning to do a board definition for the M5 stamp C3. 
No specific reason for these boards, just wanted to practice making board divisions, and C3 boards are very affordable. And I would remind you, we have C3 support, but it's very early. There are things that are broken. So don't buy C3 as a C3 board as your only board right now, is what I would just say. Um, next is David Gloud, who's uh, text only. Um, CircuitPython, I'm testing and promoting Disco Tool from Naradoc. No progress on my web workflow test and usage. Non-CircuitPython, I have work in progress changing the brain of, of my Nabaz tag with tag tag tag, an adaptation board that uses a Pi Zero W. I don't know what any of these things are, but it makes you want to Google them, so thank you. Okay, next up is Deshipu. <coughs> so I have been playing with this uh, just gesture sen sensor, the PAJ7620, and I think I, I got it working with Circuit Python, which is nice. Uh, I, I hope to uh, get a library uh, done for it. It's nice because it detects uh, like uh, motion in front of it, like up, down, left, right, forward, backward, clockwise, counterclockwise, and also waving. And it can also, uh, it also has a cursor mode, so you can, uh, by moving your hand in front of it, you can move a virtual cursor that can then be displayed on something. So I think it's a very interesting device. <coughs> and uh, the reason I, I'm working on that is because I went back to my Flavback robots, the, the four-legged walking robots, and uh, obviously this sensor would be nice for, you know, con controlling your robot with gestures. Yeah, that's it. All right, thank you. This that's It sounds like a very interesting gesture sensor. It just sounds like it does more than the one that uh, we sell as a breakout. Um, next is Dexter Starboard, who's not present, so I'll read theirs. Looking forward to CircuitPython Day 2022. Uh, I posted a related video on Show & Tell and it's in the Show and Tell channel, and um, you can look for Dexter Star Wars posts there. Text testing web workflow on Funhouse and Unexpected Maker Pro S3. All right, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, this last week I continued uh, working on the Octopus Game Guide. I kind of dove uh, more into the Hack Tablet branch um, inside the core. This is a, a different branch of the core code. I made some tweaks inside there to frame buffer display in order to force it to refresh even when there aren't any dirty regions, uh, because it turns out the display we have kind of like fades away. If you stop sending it data, you have to keep sending it the current picture if you want it to uh, keep showing. So uh, I figured that out inside that branch. A um, couple other tweaks inside there was around the refresh rate to make it a little bit slower, uh, which got rid of some Visual artifacts that we were seeing on the screen, and I have a little bit more about that in the weeds. Um, I made a multi-touch example for that uh, tablet this week, and just from there started planning out, um, trying to build like a portal base style helper uh, for that tablet, so for easy IoT projects to fetch things similar to Pi Portal. Um, I'll be publishing uh, the announcement and the instructions uh, later on today for the Hack Tablet giveaway, and then um, my last thing was just planning stuff around CircuitPython Day. So the panel and then uh, my Game Jam stream will be going on that day. So I've been doing some planning around those. Thanks. OK, thanks, Foamy Guy. OK, next up is Jeff. Hi. So I wanted to lead off by talking about why we updated or why we uploaded all of our libraries to PyPI and uh, why we will do it going forward. So before now, we did it only for libraries that we thought were useful with Blinka so that you could use them on a standard computer. But uh, the way that Thani likes to install libraries on a CircuitPython device is by getting them from PyPI. And I talked to Thani developer Ivar on GitHub for a little bit, and we decided that the best approach uh, was to not add something like CircuitPython to Thani, but to let it use PyPI, and therefore that we would publish all of the CircuitPython libraries to PyPI, even if they don't run on standard desktop Python. Uh, we could have made different decisions, uh, but this is the decision we made. And that reminds me, I need to go file an issue 
saying to change around the prompts within cookie cutter so this option isn't offered anymore to not publish. Anyway, so getting on to my actual work, uh, last week I got the ESP32 Feather version 1 to a state where it can boot into CircuitPython, uh, but there are caveats. There is a draft pull request open, so you can take a look at that. Uh, the main weirdness that I know about is that when I disable PSRAM entirely, it uh, can't finish booting or boots to safe mode, saying it can't find CircuitPython. Uh, so PSRAM is in a state where it's turned on, but the early initialization of the ESPIDF is allowed to continue if PSRAM is not detected. The downside to this is there's some growth in code size, but also there is, I think, at least two GPIOs that are now not usable because they would have been used for PSRAM. In non-CircuitPython stuff, I learned about how QMK supports OLED displays. Um, I've certainly seen some YouTube videos where people put OLED displays on their keyboards, and now I know a little bit about how that works, so that's cool. And then today, just this morning, I got the KB2040 and the Stemma QT uh, 128 by 32 OLED display working together in QMK, and that'll be a part of the upcoming guide. And this week, I hope to wrap up that guide. I will write one of these new Learn System profile pages that have been recently added by the development team of Learn. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the main thing then that I will spend my time on after that is uh, getting image capture module support on the ESP32 S3. Um, there are some the details of the peripherals are different between the S2 and the S3, so it's not just a matter of enabling it and checking that it works. And the first thing is to dig in and figure out how much work is it um, to support. Uh, coming up, I'm going to have lower activities on some days. A friend is staying with us uh, for the week from Tuesday through um, Sunday or Monday. And I will be doing CircuitPython day planning as needed, but I think Katni is really creating a straight road for me on that, and I don't have much to explicitly do. And I'm also planning to be out August 11 to 18, again, with the same uh, friend who's visiting. So that's what I've got going on. If I'm around a little less than usual, uh, that's why. I've got a friend visiting. OK, thank you, Jeff. OK, next up is Katni. Dan. So last week, I finished adding Whippersnapper setup and usage pages to three guides. Uh, started on the Whippersnapper usage page for a fourth guide. Um, continued circuit Python day planning and had a short week. Over the long weekend, toured on to walls, uh, walls in quotes, because it was really badly built with super janky wooden paneling and uh, a bunch of built-in shelving and learned a hundred times over how not to build things um, as we tried to tear this apart and it was awful. Um, but then we framed in four walls into two rooms, drywalled the entire thing, got through two coats of drywall mud, and we're pretty sure we have everything we need to finish it. So this week, uh, finishing up the Whippersnapper usage page for Pi Portal. Um, this is actually wrong because my assignment set changed uh, before this meeting. Um, I'm going to be making a template for feather boards for power management. Um, they all have one, but apparently it was all created b before we had templates, and so it's something like 25 pages, all of which are almost identical, and um, we want to replace it with a single template. So I'll be working on that once I'm done with the Pi Portal page. And this is a short week again. Uh, tomorrow I will be installing two doors. Uh, evenings during this week, finish mudding the drywall, and then uh, the upcoming long weekend is cleaning up and priming, or attempting to clean up, because drywall dust stays forever. Um, and then maybe painting the outside walls and uh, maybe installing our iron filter. But basically it's a jam-packed uh, week for me, that long weekend is not really a weekend off. And that's what I've got. All right. Thank you, Katni. Okay, next up, KMatch. Thanks, Dan. So past week, some minor debugging on the ESP32 S3 dot clock display module uh, that goes along with the hack tablet and any other RGB devices you might want to connect to that. Uh, also related to the giveaway, I built up five more of those hack tablets. 
Uh, and as Foamy Guy mentioned, contact him for more details. And it sounds like more information is coming. Um, also, another project I'm working on is uh, trying to measure a passing sphere, uh, basically a bowling ball. And I tested a time of flight sensor, and it looks promising. I've measured I don't know, five or six points during the pulse, and I hope I can be able to fit that. Uh, and so that's my work this week. See if I can understand enough about basal, basic signal processing to comprehend that measurement pulse and make some sense out of it. And then on uh, non-circuit Python, if you've taken a few days off to visit family. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, KMatch. Okay, uh, Maker Melissa is now in the chat, so go ahead. Hello. Um, so last week I worked on Edge Impulse to figure out how to train a machine learning model. And then I created an example in Arduino to get the machine learning model running on the KB2040. And I started taking a look at code.circuitpython.org to see what needed to be updated to start adding web workflow into it. Uh, this week I'm going to start working on refactoring code.circuitpython.org so we can have the web workflow added. And then once it's refactored, I'll add that in. And I'll possibly be working on writing up an ed, a guide on the Edge Impulse stuff I worked on. And also I'll be probably working on some preparations for a CircuitPython day live stream. And that's it. OK, thank you. OK, uh, next up is Neurodox contribution, which I'll read. Uh, last week, continuing to work on web circup for the web workflow and PR fixes to access control. This week, more web workflow. OK. Next is uh, Paul Cutler. Go ahead. Thanks, Dan. Uh, there's a new episode of the podcast out today with KMatch talking about the hack tablet. So some great timing on that with all the work that Tim's doing. Um, and then if you haven't heard, there will be a panel on CircuitPython Day um, that I'll be hosting. And lots of work is going on around that this week. And I met with all the panelists last week. Thanks. OK, thank you. Okay, next is Scott. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm booting up back up because I took last week off, which was awesome. Uh, I know that I have to finish the port environment variable PR, um, and I've got a bunch of tabs open to go through as well. Um, I'm excited to work with Melissa on code.circuitpython.org this week. Um, we're going to chat later about that too. And then I also do want to refine the title bar status because right now we only use it for web, but I'd like to use the title bar status bar for other other status as well, like the state of code.py, and we could do USB status and stuff there too. So um, that's what I'll get to if I work through all the web workflow stuff. OK, thank you, Scott. OK, mm -hmm. and finally, a tech trick who's not in the chat, so I'll read theirs. Uh, last week, updated the I2C address learn guide with instructions on how to add new addresses. We now have a mechanism for doing that, so people can do that without um, by, by submitting a PR. Added ability for the cookie cutter template to verify the user's cookie cutter is at a minimum version, which for reference is now version 2.1. Added uh, underscore underscore version underscore underscore fix for libraries that have pyproject.toml. So and submitted a PR with type annotations for Adafruit BLE. Adafruit BLE. Let's fix that. Uh, this week, update the remaining learn guide examples using the gamepad shift module. Final touch ups on my generation scripts for the pyproject.toml switchover. And follow up on changes to Adabot and fix anything that breaks during the daily scheduled build of circuitpython.org. And I'll just reference here that. PyProject the Tahamba is kind of a more modern way of doing stuff than setup.py. It's a more declarative way of uh, describing how to install and a and build a um, well install a, Pyth a Python library. Following week, the last thing, vacation, taking a road trip with my girlfriend down to DC, so taking the week to relax. Okay, thanks, Tetric. Okay, our last section is in the weeds which is where we have long form discussions about things that we probably like to have a back and forth on. And uh, we're not maybe sure who to discuss it with. So uh, it's open to everyone. If you have any in the weeds topics that you'd like to bring up, please make sure they get added to the notes doc while we're discussing other things. OK, so with that, I'll turn it over to Foamy Guy uh, for their uh, um, 
in the weeds uh, question. Yeah, thanks, Stan. Um, I have a question around frame buffer display. Um, I was doing some digging around inside of there to work on the hack tablet. And I was noticing a couple of things that might be helpful to add arguments for. But before I got too far down the road of doing it, I wanted to get feedback to see if it made sense to add arguments for these things or if there's some other way that I might not be uh, knowing about or considering. So um, the, the main two things are the refresh rate. Um, there's a default, as far as I could tell, there was just a default inside the core of 60 for the the kind of target refresh rate that it will use when it has auto refresh on. And we found that a slower rate um, was better for this particular screen. So I wondered if we if it makes sense to add an argument for that so that it can be initialized and then set to the lower rate. Um, and then the other one was the basically the ability to skip the dirty region check. So Display.io uh, internally has checks to make sure that things have actually changed. And if they haven't, then generally it won't draw a new update to the screen. But on this particular screen, we actually need it to still send the data to the screen. Otherwise, it kind of like fades fades out, um, kind of like uh, back to the future picture style, if you imagine the, the image fading away. Um, so I figured out where, or, or KMatch actually figured out where in the core we can change that to basically skip the check. Uh, but I wondered if it made sense to add that as an argument so people could turn it on and off. And if it's you know, it will default to, to off. And so the today's behavior will be the same. It won't refresh when it doesn't need to. You could turn it on and then it will uh, copy the memory every time that it, you know, every time that it refreshes the display. OK, thanks. Um, does anybody have comments? So I guess there's two things. There's, there's the refresh rate and there's the dirty bit as optional arguments. They sound yep. both sound reasonable to me. Uh, Scott, you have something to say? I, I think Jeff does. Um, I was just going to uh, start with saying for a dot clock display, I think just by you know you've got a certain number of clocks that are going to occur per frame. So the time of one frame is a computable value. I was looking in this data sheet that Kmatch linked to, and if you multiply it all out. Uh, it ends up being 60 hertz is the nominal frequency of a frame. Um, so it would be an, an item that you could compute, but maybe you're computing it in Python rather than in C. And in that case, you wouldn't need to send it in. Uh, the other thing I would say is, I think there's an important distinction between when you have a dirty region, that means you need to recompute some of the pixels um, and you need to send the bits out to the display to keep the display refreshing. And maybe those need to be disentangled. And I'm relatively confident you don't want to recompute all the pixels on the screen, but you do need to do this other step. So however it is, you need to do that. But I think that would be a characteristic of any of these dot clock displays that you need to continuously or near continuously renew the pixels to them, but that's different than the not than I see. making a choice about whether to recompute the pixels of the display. I think I that's what I mean to say. Okay. Yeah, I think I probably have those two conflated in my mind: the the dirty regions versus needing to send it out to the display. Right, and I think I think that um, like the difference is well, I'm looking at RGB matrix, but it's not actually RGB matrix. But like, there's the frame buffer display class, but then there's also the frame buffer itself. And for the refresh rate, like the default of 60 should be fine from the frame buffer display side. But I think you want the refresh rate to come from the frame buffer itself so that the default doesn't get used, uh, if that makes sense. OK, I can. Yeah, I think we are initializing both so I can look uh, closer. Yeah, like the, the FB getter thing is doing a function call into uh, is it is it dot clock display? What is the module? Um, dot clock display is the module where the new uh, code is that drives. Oh, that oh okay, and that's in a PR. Display. That's why it's yeah, there. or in a branch. I don't think we have even a PR for it yet. Okay, but yeah. So I I, I feel like maybe maybe in both cases you need the dot clock display to tell 
to, to manage the, like, if you need to pass keyword arguments in, pass it there, and then you, the frame buffer display will call, do the FB getter call into it. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess okay. that's... This what is the RGB suggest. matrix one. Uh, get okay, so we we would get it from inside of there, and that's where it can be declared. Yeah, let's see. Let's pull it up. Take a look through RGB matrix as well. It sounds like that's a good example of, I guess, probably the most recently added kind of display type. Oh, I saw the issue go by. Yeah. Uh, do we have a link to the branch for this? Um. Yeah. Yeah, so RGB matrix ends up having the actual uh, refreshing of the display happen by um, timer interrupt, um, which is separate from background tasks, which is separate from display IO, which doesn't care whether you have a long running Python thing or if the garbage collector is running. So it kind of keeps running despite almost everything um, at a fixed pace. And that may be the kind of thing that you need for these displays. But that's the kind of thing that needs uh, microcontroller specific support. So you know you'll know you're working on the the S2 or the S3 or whatever it is, and you could create some specific timer code that made it happen 60 times a second, regardless of what display I/O the display I/O part is doing, regardless of whether display I/O is dirty or not. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that will fit into the organization of your code because I haven't looked at it, but that would kind of be my gut um, idea. So I think so this is a bit similar to how uh, Pew module, module works using the interrupts to, to display uh, things on the on the matrix on the LED matrix. So it also has to like uh, run in the background all the time. But uh, I didn't actually connect it to display I also this is a bit more. I think you would want to Basically, display I was designed for those displays with internal memory that has have the SPI bus, and uh, you write the memory to them. And maybe you could make this frame buffer display like uh, simulate that in the structure, not have actual SPI bus, but uh, you can you can uh, pass uh, like custom buses to the display I/O. And you would basically have a new bus type that that's basically simulating the external memory by using internal memory. I don't know if that makes sense. I see. Yeah, kind of like replacing almost the the like four wire sort of layer as a different um, different kind of option that you pass to the display when you create it. Be interesting. I mean, this is. This is where it, you already have a cut, basically, in, in the current architecture. So that's where you can plug in uh, easily. Not sure how that would be uh, performance-wise. OK. Yeah, definitely give it a try. Let's see, dev clock, native frames per second. Oh, OK, OK, get native frames per second. So we implement that, and then it will basically ask the subclass uh, for it when it gets used. OK. Right. This is like a, a protocol thing. So in the bottom of dot clock, the bottom of dot clock, oh, and I lost my tab. Yeah, at the bottom of dot clock, you can see you're like connecting um, like struct members to functions to call. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you would add a dot get native dot get native frames per second, and then you'd be able to tell it what value to actually go on. Okay, and then I can. It makes sense to pass that into the constructor to dot matrix display, and then basically it will return whatever the user set. Uh, or uh, should I you, just yeah, you it? could have you could pass it in the dot clock display frame buffer construct. Instructor. Okay. Uh, but I think just right generally, like y you want to manage um, you y for frame buffer stuff, you kind of can manage when the refreshes happen. 
um, because you're managing the frame buffer itself, um, which okay. is different than how Display IO works for non frame buffer frame buffer things. Um, and then one last comment. This is in shared module, but it has ESP specific stuff in it, so I would move it to common HAL under ports expressive. The um, dot clock display. Oh yeah, the dot clock display module. Yeah. Okay. Just because shared modules for something that would work across ports. Of course. Okay. Although so I, I I've skirted that rule for the web workflow stuff temporarily. To um. You said two ports, Espressif, Common How? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I can know to do that as well. Oops. Thank you. I definitely appreciate uh, everybody's comments and ideas. I think that gives no me a lot of direction to go on. And this is Kim, I if I could belabor it just another moment on the same related topic. Um, in, in these uh, displays, there's two sort of frames per second. One is this native frames per second, but yet there's another in the refresh. I think it's in a refresh uh, a structure about requesting a target frames per second. Uh, I couldn't intent or separate those out in the code or understand the differences between those two. Uh, could maybe Scott or Jeff, could you guys comment on when each of those take an effect or how those where, relate to each other? Where are you looking? Uh, I think display. Uh, yeah, I think in a normal display, you can set it. I think it's in the refresh function. You can request a target frames per second and a minimum frames per second. Right. So target is we won't refresh faster than that. So if you if your code's running faster than that, we'll actually delay. So this is like if you want a while loop that's going to run every 60 frames per second, like it, it can um, hold you to that. And then the minimum is the, like if you don't, if your loop runs so slow that you don't hit your minimum, it will raise an exception. Okay. I'm not sure I observe that uh, or not, because <laughs> it, it can seems be broken. like when, it seems when, you know, when, when we were having issues that Foamy guy fixed it with this native frames per second, but the target frames didn't have an effect. So I wasn't sure. It seems like each of them are behaving or uh, somehow being checked differently. And I'm, I wasn't sure on the logic. I couldn't follow it uh, immediately. Yeah. Comprehend I, haven't it, looked, so. I haven't looked at it in a while. OK. All right, no um, worries. The, the, yeah, so the rest. difference between target and minimum is is target is if you're running faster than it, it will slow you down so that your loop runs at that speed. Um, and then minimum will raise an exception if, you're, if your loop was too slow to hit that. And then there's native frames per second also. That's, that's where I got lost. It seemed to, in this case, well, na native. Well, is it, so native is, is for auto refresh, I think, whereas the refresh call here is if you're managing it yourself. Uh, okay, that was my misunderstanding. Okay, I thought I misunderstood thinking target frames was actually setting the auto refresh rate, but okay, so, maybe that makes more sense. So I think I think the refresh call is explicitly like you're managing it yourself. Got it. Okay. Oh, so okay, that makes more sense of why changing that target frames had no effect then. Yeah, it does say okay. when auto when auto refresh is off. And target frames per second is none. This waits for the target frame rate and then refreshes the display running returning true. Got it. Okay. Should have read the docs. Okay. If if the call has taken too long since the last refresh call for the given target frame rate, then the refresh returns false immediately without updating the screen to hopefully get caught up. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. That makes a lot more sense now. Okay. If you Thanks. yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, is it uh, anything else? Or shall we wrap up? I'll go ahead and. I think up. everything is good for my end. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that discussion. Okay, so finally, uh, this is a wrap up time. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for July 25th, 2022. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. 
will release the video of this meeting on YouTube at youtube youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, the meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, August 1st, as usual, at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time. And um, you, remember, you can go to adafru.it slash discord to get an invite to the Adafruit Discord and join the meeting. And to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at sign circuit Pythonista's role on Discord. So we hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. And with that, I will stop recording. <laughs>